the Juilliard School, jumped right away at, at the idea to having her for a professor. And she turned out, I think, to be the most brilliant professor they had. Rosina was the reigning empress, there's no question about it. She was the one, if you were a Levine student, there was a little cachet about you. And she was her class that was dominating the school. I think Mrs. Levine personally stood for the, the, the kind of piano teaching that was at the top of the, of the world. She could do so much for a student and get so much out of a student through inspiration. I was so really in awe of what she knew and what she represented. And even more, I think, by the whole world that she'd come from. The Russian school of piano playing was a, a romantic type of playing instituted by Anton Rubinstein, the great pianist, the contemporary of Liszt. Romantic, of course, means personally expressive, which meant that you could take a piece of music and interpret it according to your feeling. Rosina Levine was a perfect product of this generation. I started to um, play the piano when I was six years old. Well, I studied with a teacher who became ill and my mother asked the director what uh, they ought to do with me, and he suggested that the star pupil of the conservatory, Joseph Levine, would give me lessons. And that's how we met. When I think of Mrs. Levine, I think of her life as a beautiful love story. When she first met Mr. Levine, she was quite young, as you know, and she told me once that the very first moment she met him, she knew in her heart that was her destiny. And so they made arrangements, and he came twice a week to give me a lesson. And he says, show me your hand. You love music? I said, yes. And he says, would you like me to play something for you? And I said, oh, yes, very much. So he played the Barker of Chopin. And now, for all my life, the Barker is what I like so much. It was remarkable because he had the gold medal when he graduated from Moscow Conservatory, and she also had the gold medal. And they were a team in every way, constantly giving to each other, supporting each other, loving each other. Joseph Levine told me very much about his wife. He told me that he's married to a pianist whom he considered just as good as he was. Joseph said, you know, that Professor Chihamiro invited me for dinner, and there will be Maxim Gorky, and Chekhov, and Shalyapin, and some other famous people because this Professor Tihamir was an outstanding mind, and he had friends of all different professions who came to his house. And this time, I was first time invited. So Joseph said to me, why don't you go and play something? So I went, and I played the E major nocturne. And a little woman came to me. You know, I like your playing even better than Mr. Levine. And I could kill her. So I gave myself a word of honor that I will never play alone.
When I married Mr. Levine, he was already a famous artist and uh, won the International Rubinstein Prize. And so I firmly decided that I would not pursue my own career. And uh, 46 years of our marriage, I really devoted myself to his career and our playing together. I remember the story very clearly. She said, you know, when we were first married, we went down to Tiflis to teach. And everybody said we would stay together a year at the most. That they were two pianists, impossible to sustain a marriage. And she said, um, I had to keep pushing Joseph to have a career because he really, if he were left to himself, he would have just taught in Tiflis for the rest of his life. He had no drive. So at the end of the summer, again, the senders the contract, and Mr. Levine said, look, what a wonderful contract they're offering us. And I was silent. Then he said, what's the matter? I said, you can go, but I am not going anymore. So we did not go to Tiflis, but instead, we went to right to the mecca of the musical world, Berlin, Germany. And Mr. Levine had his piano, and there he rolled his sleeves and he started to work. And the picture changed completely. Most likely, if it had not been for Mrs. Levine, he wouldn't maybe have played as many concerts as he did, which gave the world such great satisfaction. I found myself in Berlin where they lived, and they received me like a, like a well, a relation of theirs. I was very often in their house, and we had wonderful seances of playing two pianos. They had very good two pianos. I remember I played the Rachmaninoff Concerto number two, and Rosina accompanied me at the orchestra on the other piano. Then Levine played with his wife something marvelous on two pianos, where well, they were wonderful. And later on, you know, in the United States, they formed the best two piano team I've ever heard in my life, and they probably will ever exist, you know, because they were both perfect virtuosos. The two piano playing was extraordinary. Extraordinary. Rosina with those little teeny hands and Joseph with those huge hands and you could hardly tell where the one left off and the other began. Now we were blessed to have our second child in 1918. In 1919 we took the boat to America and when we came here we made it our permanent home, uh, became American citizen. Mr. Levine was the first one to be invited uh, to teach at the Juilliard School when it was even not formed as a school. The faculty was really wonderful. Leopold Auer for violin and Marcello Zembrich violin and then Kohansky a little later and Hutchison and Friedberg and Zilotti and uh, after the second year, Madame Olga Samaro. When Mr. Levine was in town, he gave lessons to some students. But there is not a single one student who did not go through my hands. The more talented he was, the sooner I recommended him to Mr. Levine. Mr. Levine enjoyed teaching, but comparatively he had a little time because he was playing all over America. I had my territories and my limited time from New York. My limit was Chicago. I don't think that I ever went to, to California with him, only when the children were already quite grown up. He 
was not the world's most faithful man, and that evidently had been going on all the way through their marriage from the very earliest time. So that must have been very difficult for her. Very difficult for her. <clears throat> she handled it very well. She learned to handle it. She joked about it. You remember the story about the woman in San Francisco? And she said, I knew that Joseph was going out to San Francisco. And so I said, you know, Joseph, you, when you get in, you must immediately go. It's in the morning. You must go to her house. Ring the doorbell. And um, so she said when Joseph came back, she said, well, how was it? And he said, well, yes, I went out to her house. And I rang the doorbell. And she came to the door. And she had cold cream on her face, and her hair was in curlers. And Rosina looked at me with this malicious look and said, I knew she slept late. <laughs> She was clever. She had learned how to deal with an erratic husband. She said, I always knew that uh, he would come back to me, that these were just little things that he had to do. But it, it must have hurt. Ms. Ledin played the season of 43 extensively. And in New York, I think everybody who remembers, it was the best recital he ever played. So now we come to 44, he had a heart attack. And unfortunately, it was a great pain in my heart, I remember. The 2nd of December, he was found dead in, in his room. Well, poor Negin died rather too young, and he left Rosina. And so in the beginning, there is a great widow of a great pianist. I was very, very low after Mr. Levine passed away and really didn't think that I could do anything. I know that she must have, in deep down in her soul, she must have known that she had to go on. And she obviously was humble. I hoped that they would keep me at the Juilliard School so I would be continuing my own work. Uh, but I certainly thought that in place of Mr. Levine, they would have somebody like Rubinstein or Serkin or somebody with a big name. Uh, but lo and behold, Hutchison called me in his office and he said, Mrs. Levine, we had a meeting yesterday and we unanimously decided uh, that we want you to continue Mr. Levine's work. And I said, uh, wait, uh, let me sit down. It's, it's too much and too wonderful, but I cannot do it. And he said, well, we trust that you can, so you try. And that gave me a new life. When I first met her, the first thing she did was show me a picture of her husband. And the first thing she gave me was one of her recordings. And she was obviously obsessed with this man. After his death, it took her some time to begin to feel her own oats, you know, and when she saw that what she did with her pupils was really remarkable, then she began to become, again, a much more assured person than you might have thought before. This must have been the stepping stone to where she knew she had to carry on with my father's name and to give the, give the world what she did give the world. I think Mrs. Levine learned this. I think she was grieving for her husband always and was extremely conscious of him and his memory always. But if her students, if the transference of this love from Joseph went to you and went to me and to the others, that's what we were getting in such an intense degree, perhaps. We were part of her recovery. After one or two or three years, the Juilliard School discovered that she was not at all a widow of the great pianist but that she was a great pianist in her own right. And she turned out to be the most brilliant professor they had. She was a total, total pedagogue, and she taught by example, too. There was a tremendous pride in belonging to her class.
That was the first thing you became aware of. The second thing was that the Levine class was like a family in a sense. There was Martin Cannon, there was John Browning, there was uh, Van Cliburn. Those were like, they were of course a star student of Levine. And so I had, you could say, many wonderful, uh, you could say older brothers, if you want to say. I remember I would be playing something and Van would come and say, yes, and he would play from behind me and his hand would just cover mine like that. She could inspire all of her students. She had a very large class and all of her students used to say that she could do so much for a student and get so much out of a student through inspiration. What was very clear from the Levine classes was that there was a, an ideal of piano playing, an ideal of integrity and beauty and uh, technical skill. <clears throat> you know, this concerto Mr. Levine played for Tchaikovsky himself. It's hard to believe. And so I think that there are some things that, um, for instance, the triplets, you know, Nowadays, everybody plays ta ra pa ra pa ra pa ra pa ra pa ra pa ra and that's how you have to study that. Madame Levine changed me completely. She was the first person to open my eyes for a wonderful, um, a very personal communication with music. Now, show me how you would practice that. I was just happy playing before her. It was a very spiritual. I can't speak for the way she was in lessons with other people, but I think she had an uncanny ability to suit the way she was teaching to what she thought the student would absorb and, and react to the, the best. She was not a dictator. She was just so severe in her demand that the person really do the, the completest development that that person was possible. And in that demand, she was very specific. But the whole character, I think, is much buoyant and much more gay than you are much to see it. And also that, that cadenza of the, of the last moment, play the last cadenza, please. She knew about technique, she knew about phrasing, she knew about style, and so she would present it to them, and then they would have to have a very good reason not to, to agree with her. But if she respected it, she let it be. She wanted always to transcend the notes on a page and to transcend the technical difficulties, to go beyond, because it must be a finished canvas in sound. There is not only one way of interpreting the piece right, but the interpretation must be logical, must be consistent, and must be based on excellent musical education and then it can be said in very different ways. Worst lesson, it lasted about five seconds. She'd get up from the couch, come over, not say a word, in the middle of the playing, shut the music, and say, the door is over there. 
I thought, what is this? She said, did you hear me? The door is over there. That's it. I thought, that's the end of my lesson? <laughs> this was in my first year. I thought, I was devastated. Devastated, you know. Go down to the cafeteria and talk to others. Oh, it happened to them. And I decided, well, this is not going to happen to me anymore. She noticed that I played the piano leaning forward in a funny position that didn't distribute my weight well. And she said, go and practice with a long yardstick down the center of your back, uh, in, you know, below your, you, held by your belt there, so that when you bend over, you'll feel it against your back bending. And it was very effective. In a very short time, I got my body weight distributed more, more naturally. And that was, you know, it, we know how important that is to getting a tone that has enough depth that the tone lasts long enough to move on to the next tone without a, a, a break in the line. I never knew whether she was, I never, I never knew exactly what she, she used so many forms of psychology, it was very hard to tell what she was really doing. If you went in and played something for her that you wanted to try out and at the end of, of your little playing of it at the lesson, she would say, you know, dear, that's not your piece. That was it. That meant don't even think about it. Don't bring it in again. I don't want to hear it again. Forget it. Sometimes that would stimulate you just out of sheer perversity to, um, to make that piece really work. You always have to remember that technique is at the service of the music and vice versa. She could isolate them and be able to put them back together. That's another phenomenal ability. Many separate them and leave them separated. And the same thing happens in that page, of course, only in a little more pronounced way, that you put your weight again, the weight arm on the third note, and then you don't strike the each key. But you transfer the weight from one key to another, and the thumb is moving gradually. And it will be again the same thing, but until the last, the last point is the thumb. You don't go there because it's a waste of time. Mrs. Levine spoke constantly, don't attack the piano like an enemy, pull out of the piano like a friend, stroke the piano like a friend. To pull away from from the fallboard towards you. And often she would stroke you and say, you know, you must play the piano this way, not hitting it, but stroke the piano like a friend. conscientiousness which remains a, uh, an ideal. She really did teach an ideal. She made you focus on, on where this uh, chord is coming from, where this line is coming from, and where it's going. And uh, to listen and to have a concept in your mind of what you want to produce, you have to hear the sound in your mind before you can attempt to produce it. She often said, she said, I want to train you to know how to present yourself when you go for auditions or you meet important people or whatever. She was always interested in the detail. She never wanted me to come to lesson wearing pants or jeans because she said that will not be the way you are on stage and you have to always when you play feel the way you're going to feel when you're when you're presenting yourself my dear colleague and friend late madame samar always said 
that a pianist is not an animal only that is heard, it's an animal who is also seen. And therefore, we have to correct their stage presence. First of all, Hans, when you bow, you did that, look up. You got up, you turned here, and then you went there. You don't do this. No, sit down, sit down. You got up, and you turn here, and you bow. Right? So that's one. <laughs> How old are you, 15? Now, for 15, it's excellent. And it's very good that you learn it now because sometimes a little later in life it probably will be one of your very good pieces. How interesting the pedaling is. How many depths the pedal has? Could you tell me about? Well, it's about two. <laughs> you know, two. Now you have to get about six. And you know, it is very, very interesting. And this piano here, I don't think that one can see. But on some other ones, you take a key and you press it just so much. And already that holds. That's number one of the pedal. Then you can press it more and more and more and more and more and more and more. At least six depths. Mm -hmm. When you play something like beginning, you use number six. It's perfectly all right. Press it. How much you weigh? Um, 120. 120. You put all your 120 pounds on the on here. <laughs> the beginning a few, few measures. But really like uh, my solo and allegro. One, two, three, four. She had a host of admirers. She had uh, loving, adoring students. And uh, she would give these master classes and, and throngs would come. Certainly, it's quite good. But, um, you know, Rachmaninoff was schoolmate of Miss Levin. And so I have it in my ears, you know, all these prelates, the way he plays. And certainly it is uh, a little... Uh, I have to be quite satisfied the way left I met her when she was teaching a master class in 64 at UCLA. And I just signed up as a good student and played a few pieces for her. And um, my world opened up. And again, when you start, it is not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, one. You see the first one, stay a little longer around. Then when you repeat the second time, you don't have to, to do that because you established already your key. There was a spirit in there conveyed through her leaning over, her putting her hand on my hand, her pressing one finger into the next of mine, saying, no, the God just sing, dear, sing. Listen to the inner voice. comes from something as simple as a breath as she breathed it and sang it. And of course, the more she sang and the more she mentioned this and you put all of her remarks together, suddenly you found, hmm, my piano's starting to sing a little bit. to be singing and um, I think that's the most important thing to try to make a percussion instrument to be a lyrical instrument when he came to me he was 17 years old and he was taught by his mother until then my class was full but after I heard him I accepted him immediately 
There is no pianistic difficulty for him, and wasn't even when he came. But what attracted me very much to him was his unique sensitivity in music. And he loves music. With classical music particularly, there's a great tradition. Every person that comes into the realm of classic art has always to look at history. I wrote him and advised him to go to Moscow. And his first letter was no, but I didn't stop there. And I wrote him four points. I said, you will work with great intensity. You will learn a great deal of new material. You will meet the cream of the pianists of the world. And last and not least, I believe that you will win. I took the receiver. They said, Russia is calling. And there was Van calling me, said, I'm all dressed up to go to play, but I want to speak with you. I saw him on the television that same evening in my alma mater, where my husband and I, we graduate, we played, and it was very exciting. First time when an American won a Russian prize was Van Cliburn. Everybody loved his playing. Why? Because he uh, embodied the nature of the Russian playing as inculcated in him by Rosina Levin. adds its own bravo to the worldwide crescendo of applause for Van Cliver, the young American who won Moscow's International Tchaikovsky Piano Competition. The 23-year-old Texan, who conquered Russia musically, receives the ticker tape parade up Broadway, a hero's procession rarely have ever accorded any musician. A great teacher is a guide and must work to help that young person, that shining new page, that wonderful new mind, that wonderful new experience, to be as independent and self-confident as possible. That's a great teacher. It is just your own personality and own individuality that count. I try as much as possible to develop the students with the idea that they must be um, interesting personalities themselves, and that will show in their music. I've forgotten what I took into her, whether it was chromatic fantasy or something, and I did it very differently from what somebody else might have done or what she had. She said afterwards, you know, dear, very different from what I hear in my head, but it's, it, it's all right. It is convincing. I leave it alone. And she said, why, I said, why do you say that to me? Why don't you show me what you, what you would do? And she said, no. She said, if you convince me, if you persuade me your way is right, I accept it and I leave it alone. It's only when I think you don't know what you want that I move in. It's a very beautiful balance between inputting into the student what you are and 
what the student can absorb and in a sense responding to what the student is and allowing that, drawing that out or allowing that to bloom as a priority, I mean, a high priority. And one day she, she asked me about the orchestra and I said to her, the orchestra is what I really love. She said, really? And I explained to her that I'd made some orchestrations and she said, do you know how to orchestrate? And I, where did you learn that? And I said, well, I, I, don't, I don't really know. I mean, I, even when I was a kid, youngster in school, had always, way back in my memory, been able to understand that. And she said, that's amazing. She said, maybe you should study that. I think she could tell from the way I was talking there was a great interest there. Yes. But the point is that I remember was she was encouraging. She, she didn't say, don't study the piano. She didn't say, don't spend your time on that. Don't, don't stop anything, just do more. I wasn't cut out somehow for the Liszt Sonata and the, the Tchaikovsky Concerto and the, these pieces that required a kind of full-time involvement in the instrument and traveling around on strange pianos alone and all that stuff. I really wanted to use the instrument in collaboration with singers and with chamber musicians mostly. And she respected that and she knew that from me very early on and was willing to give it her all anyway. She understood where my innate strengths and weaknesses were and had a, a strong instinct for pushing me to improve what I really could and somehow understanding what was innate to my, my growth. That's, uh, I don't know how you, how you can account for that in any way except uh, great thanks. I never felt that I was with somebody who was 50 years older than me. We would walk her home, but these to me were very insightful times. We'd go down the hall, she'd meet different faculty. We'd go out, she'd talk to all the people that worked in the coat room, the janitors, the, the people cleaning in the school, whatever. They were, she loved everybody. Okay, they were all talking to her, Madame Levy. Then we walked down the street and she'd stop and pick up this baby and talk to this person on the way. I just couldn't believe it. Um, and whatever was on her mind, she was a tremendous uh, raconteur. She liked people, she liked to have people around her. She was not, uh, I think, somebody who really liked to be alone much. Um, and that was just, uh, but she turned it, uh, she used to say all the time, uh, this, oh, she said, this is like Grand Central Station, her, her apartment, she had that little one bedroom apartment up at Claremont Avenue, and sometimes there'd be, you know, eight or nine students crowded in just at various stages, one bringing her something, one having a lesson, one coming for a lesson, one leaving from a lesson, one, yeah. but she liked that, and the phone would ring, and the doorbell would ring, and the, <laughs> it was all, and she loved it, I think she loved it. I was walking her once on Claremont Avenue, and she was talking about great experiences in her life, and this concert, and Mr. Levy, and that, and, and nobody was like Hoffman, and this and that. I said, and that concert was a real experience. And at that moment, her slip fell to her ankles. She didn't skip a beat. She looked down, and she said, and this is quite the experience, too. <laughs> and she stepped right out of it. I picked up her slip, and we continued walking down Claremont Avenue. I never heard of a mazurka, so she would stay up and then she would dance mazurka for me and in the 412 my words wasn't quite right so we would words together <laughs> but she was always one of us she was our pal she was our friend she was madame levine my teacher my grandmother my um what to say i mean my dance instructor my shrink my everything and that's what teach her in the truest sense, because she, she taught all the human quality. Music is just an outlet through which that this human quality is taught. I had, I feel honored. I mean, most humbled by that great love that she gave so completely, so completely. I think it is important, though, that we talk about her depressions 
understanding that Rosina was one of those people who was, in a sense, in a state of recovery. She would never talked to me very much about the depressions, and then only as I grew to know her better over the years, and when she would, when she finally allowed me to call her Rosina, when she was depressed, she didn't teach. And it might be two days, it might be a week. She would let very few of us see her, but I would call her very often, and I would just hear this <sighs> heavy breathing, and she would say, oh dear, how to help myself, how to help myself. And she would repeat this over and over and over. She said, always when these depressions hit me, the numerology and the superstitions return. And I tried so hard to get them out of my life and to live like a modern person. She knew that she was really ridden, driven by nerves, as she called it. Uh, and superstitions, of which Tolstoy and Pushkin were filled with. Her mother was intelligent, but also very, very, very superstitious. When she was 18 months, she got scarlet fever, and so the doctor told my grandmother she might as well just take her home because she's going to die anyway. So, of course, she survived, and as a result then, her mother absolutely treated her like such a hothouse flower. You never touched anything because there might be a germ. So she was, you know, brought up in this kind of an atmosphere of fear herself. She never went anywhere alone, and she was always bundled up. There was a part of her, of course, that she did not reveal, yes. I think the, the, the more troubled parts of her personality, the things that, the fears that she would have, she uh, would only reveal those to those she was really close to. She was um, very much aware of her own problems, and she really Again, I don't think she would have worked as hard at reforming herself or changing herself or improving herself if there had not been the depressions. But then it would lift. It would lift. And then she would be absolutely fine. Oh, today I'm wondering. Today it's, it's all gone. It's finished. She would give the impression, of course, of being just an indomitable uh, uh, personality, which she was. Uh, part of what made her so special to me in, in, in later life was the feeling that she was insecure. For me, that was never important. It never changed my opinion of her one whit, any more than if she had cancer, which, which she did. When it came to saving her life and, and putting it back together, she was scared to death of all kinds of little things, but when it came to big things, like when she had her surgery, the cancer surgery, both times, she never let my brother or me know. So she had this iron will. Now, as far as the cancer was concerned, the constant problem with the swelling and the possible damage to the arms, she played and played wonderfully with double mastectomy. I was the first lesson after lunchtime. And I arrived right on time, and I heard someone playing, and I said, well, I don't think she has a student, but, and I, I was almost hesitant to go in, but yet I said, no, I'm on time, and so going in, and it was she playing. And uh, to this day, I shall never forget her. She almost stopped, and I said, oh, please continue, and she finished the piece, and it was so gorgeous. I was invited to um, join the faculty in Aspen in 1955. I was 75. The chairman of the faculty said, um, wouldn't you like to take part in the festival of Aspen and play a solo concerto? That was very enticing. I um, was afraid, though, to a certain extent, because years and years and years I never played alone. Uh, but uh, I like challenges, so I accepted it. And I said I will play if I could play a Mozart concerto because at that time of my life, and maybe until now, Mozart is my first love.
she became eventually convinced to play in public as much as she did in the late years was, you know, thank God, because it gave us the chance really to hear this kind of pianism uh, live, and that was invaluable. I was turning pages for her at Town Hall. She was playing Mozart K467. And we were up in the dressing room just before, and she had a panicky anxiety attack. And she was sitting at the piano warming up, and her hands got clammy and cold, and she thought, oh, Jimmy, I can't do it. Uh, it'll be all full of wrong notes. I said, sweetheart, the whole audience is full of pianists who can all get up and play the whole piece without one wrong note, and nobody would pay a dime to hear any of them do it. And she started to laugh. And she, she said, oh, I said, they are not worrying about whether you play a wrong note or not. They're coming because they want to hear the way you feel about this, and there's no, no question. And she came out on the stage and played absolutely beautifully. Welcome in applause for Rosina Levine, followed by an admiring Leonard Bernstein on this greatly anticipated occasion, playing the piano concerto number no. one in E minor by Chopin. kind of a record, isn't it, playing a soloist with a Philharmonic at the age of 82? Well, I think so myself. I think it's pretty magnificent. To play with the, uh, one of the world-famous orchestra under the baton of Mr. Bernstein must be a satisfaction to any piano. Oh. Is this your first time with the Philharmonic? Yes, Bar? and it is so exciting. You know, I couldn't be more excited than if I were 18. Perform, that was my first love. I think it must have been the best performance of the piece I ever heard. It was so beautiful in legato, so spontaneously communicated, so buoyant and brilliant and uh, scintillating. History of a sort was made at the New York Philharmonic Concert when Rosina Levine played Chopin's E minor concerto. She is 82 years old, and certainly no woman in history has accomplished an equal feat. As far as that goes, very few men have. In the coda of the first movement, she ripped out those little left-hand trills like an enthusiastic kid. She won cheers and a standing ovation, and she deserved them. many celebrations this season for various reasons, all of them important, but none of which has given us more pleasure than tonight's event when we are assembled here to pay tribute to our beloved and respected Rosina Levine. My friends, distinguished guests, and everybody who was kind enough to come to celebrate my 90th birthday. It is more than half of my life that I am teaching at the Juilliard School of Music, and I cannot express with words what it has meant to me. I like individualities. I treasure that in a student.
She had a healthy ego, but I don't think it was involved so much in the solo image. Uh, if she had any uh, pride, it was the greatest in her pupils. She said playing is glamorous, but teaching is, is noble because you are passing on to youth the culture and knowledge that you have. Teaching great music to gifted people is a great joy. And we saw her and how fulfilling it was to her. Сделай все, что только можешь, потому что надо использовать ту силу, которую мне Господь Бог дает. It's all a great sense of continuity. And then as she taught, so I teach. You play like a Russian, or they would say you came from the Russian school. And I have studied with American teachers, but they all saw me as Russian pianists, and they said I have Russian soul, Russian technique. Sometimes I even consider myself a Russian pianist. And now I realize that's because I am the granddaughter of a Russian master here. Surely, the legacy is in in us, is in what we learn and the ideals that she, she developed in us and that we pass on to the next generation. And thank God there is some recording we can hear so that it, it follows in this uh, artistic continuum. <laughs> 